So my name is Professor Sue Black and I'm the Director of the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification at the University of Dundee. I am an anatomist by trade but I'm also a forensic anthropologist and the forensic anthropology side is, is what we're going to talk about today. The, the forensic word is a Latin word which means pertaining to the forum and the forum were the courts of Rome and the anthropology bit is Greek so it just means the study of man. So when you put them both together what forensic anthropology is about is the study of the human or what remains of the human for medical legal purposes. So it's about saying most of the time who was this person, who is this person. It's often about identification and if I can ask you to be a little bit of the uh, experiment if you like because the one great thing about anatomy is you take your body with you so you're there always as something to demonstrate on yourself. So if you were to look at the pattern of veins on the back of your hands and you compare the pattern that you can see on your right hand with a pattern that you can see on your left hand. Now, if your hands are a bit fat like mine, don't worry, you can turn over and you can see it on the inside of your wrist. And I absolutely guarantee that the pattern of veins you find on your right will be different to the patterns of veins that you can find on your left. And anatomy has known that since the times of Vesalius in the 1500s. This is not anything new. But it's really new to the forensic world. So if we know that vein patterns are visible, and let's face it, this is the part of your body along with your face that is almost always exposed to everybody that you meet, how can we tell something about who you are just by able, being able to look at the vein patterns in the back of your hand? Well, there are five quite distinct pillars associated with forensic identification. The first is detection. So can we detect that there's a feature? Well, you can see them because, because they're, they're blue and they stand out in a pattern. Can we recognize them as veins? So what else is there on the back of the hand? If you wiggle your fingers up and down, you'll see the tendons of your muscles moving. So they're not colored blue, they're just white under the surface and they all go in the same direction. So we can detect the veins, we can recognize them as veins. What we also know is that pattern that you've got on the back of your hand is exactly the same pattern as you were born with because that pattern started to develop when you were inside mum and it doesn't change. You don't grow new veins, you don't lose them. Once you've got them, they're there forever. And that pattern, if it's different between your right hand and your left hand, it's going to be different to everybody that's in your class or even everybody who's in your family. And because they're different between people, that's exactly the same principle that Alec Jeffries had with DNA that says, hold on a minute, if, if this thing is different between different people, can we use it to identify you? Can we use it to prove that you are who you say you are and that who you say you are is who you've always been? And that's a really important bit about identity. And that requires you to look at the third pillar, which is comparing. So if I have a vein pattern, can I compare it with a photograph to say that photograph has come from the same person? Or you imagine you go into a bank and you try to, to pass a fraudulent check. And as you pass that bit of paper over the counter to the teller in the bank, there's a camera up above and it will record the transaction. So I will for a very brief second see the vein pattern on the back of your hand. Now if at the end of the day you say hold on a minute I didn't put that into the bank I will look at your vein pattern, I will look at that vein pattern, now they'll say you're lying because you did or I'm going to say do you know you're absolutely right you're telling the truth it wasn't you. So I need to evaluate what's the strength of the comparison. Is it a really strong clear picture of the individual or is there some doubt because it's not a very good CCTV uh, recording, it might be a little bit fuzzy. So we have to look at statistics. And that's the big important thing about science. You can't look at science without looking at maths or looking at statistics because it's our evaluation of how important is this information, how sound is this information, how much can we rely on it. So we have to, to really undertake a, a very thorough research protocol. Now, it may well be that we have to say, Do you know, it's not a very strong likelihood that this is the same individual, but, you know, I can't exclude them. Or it might be a very good quality and I might be able to say that little variation, that little connection, that little pattern that you get just right there on the back, that's really rare. We only see that in about 1 in 10,000 people. That becomes really important because the jury are now saying the ability to exclude this individual is drastically reduced and our ability to include them that they are the likely perpetrator of the crime is enhanced.
them. So we've had detection, recognition, comparison, evaluation, communication. We need to be simple, we need to be clear, we need to be able to understand it. And if we've done all of that, then it's up to the jury to decide on the guilt or the innocence. And in this country, that may mean that somebody loses their liberty. It may mean that they're in prison for a number of years. But in some countries around the world, that may equate to a death sentence. And that's extremely important. That's why the science has to be beyond reproach. It's why we have to be so incredibly careful about our research, our analysis, our evaluation and our reporting capabilities. When somebody's life literally depends on your scientific evidence in the courtroom, science doesn't get much more powerful and important than that. Mm -hmm.